Hello guys. Um, so we'll continue our discussion on the November 18 RTP. In the earlier video, we had uh, discussed question 1 to 9. In this video, we should be discussing the balance part that is from question 10 to 20. Okay, uh, let's go to question number 10. So this is a question which is um, on uh, India's uh, 16 predominantly that is property, plant and equipment along with India's 37 that is provisions and contingencies. So in this question, the company has incurred 2 crore uh, rupees to construct a facility. Well, that is... Uh, to be included as a part of the cost of the asset as per India 16. Now remember India 16 quite clearly mentions that the cost of an asset includes apart from the expenses to construct the asset and directly attributable expenses it also includes something called as a provision for site restoration as well as decommissioning. So if at the end of the useful life if you are under an obligation to uh, 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 restore the site back to its original position even that should be included the, as a part of the cost at the time of initial recognition itself. Now it is interesting that in index 37 uh, 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 the provisions are required to be created for both legal obligations uh, that is obligations that arise due to law or due to contract so if you are under an obligation under law to restore the site or you have contractually agreed with someone to restore the site then you will have to create a provision because it is a legal obligation additionally India 37 also requires you to create a provision for constructive obligations now constructive obligations are those obligations that arise due to past practices uh, or due to published policies which create an expectation in the minds of the affected parties so in the given case uh, we can see that uh uh, 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 the company has a past practices as a past practice of restoring uh, the site back to its original uh, uh, condition and hence this creates an expectation in the minds of the affected parties. So the company in this question is under a constructive obligation to restore and under India's an obligation covers both legal obligation as well as a constructive obligation. So in this case the company is under a constructive obligation to restore and hence we will have to create a provision for site restoration even though we are under no legal obligation to restore. Now as this expenditure is to be paid after 40 years, uh, the effect of time is material and hence we will have to record the provision at a present value basis. Okay, So in the given question, the cost of the property would include that the, um, the amount that has been paid for the property that is 2 crore rupees that is initial expenses. Well it will also include a provision for site restoration that is an expected 1 crore expenditure to be incurred after 40 years. The question has given you a present value factor at 0 0.142 and hence uh, there will be a provision of 14,20,000 that gets created and hence the initial cost of the asset will be recorded at 2 crore 14,20,000. Okay. Uh, Okay, the asset gets ready to use on 1st of October though it is put to use from January. Remember you capitalize the asset from the day it is ready to use and you start depreciating the asset from the day it is ready to use and hence this entry is passed on 1st of October 2017 itself. Okay, the question asks us to show the impact on the financial statements for the year 1718. So during the year, once the asset is ready for use, that is from 1st of October 2017, we will start depreciating the asset. Uh, the asset has a useful life of... 40 years and during the year 6 months have, uh, 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 there are 6 months uh, uh, which are still remaining and hence uh, we will subtract the depreciation. The depreciation for a period of 6 months will be recorded that is 2,67,500. So your property, plant and equipment will consist of uh, this facility after considering the depreciation the second effect of which will be seen in the profit and loss account so as you can see in the profit and loss account we show a depreciation and amortization of 267750 uh, that is 40 years uh, a depreciation and half year uh, uh, half for the current year similarly under the heading of provisions long term provisions we will show provision for site restoration now provision was recorded on 1st of october 2017 your your expenditure that is expected to be paid after 40 years is around 1 crore Currently, we have recorded it at 14,20,000. So, slowly, slowly that 14,20,000 should unwind and reach around uh, 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 1 crore. So, this is unwinding of discount that we have done. We have compressed the 1 crore of provision into present value terms at 14,20. Now, eventually you need to pay 1 crore only and hence slowly, slowly that 14,20 will proceed towards 1 crore. Uh, that is called as unwinding of discount. This is nothing but due to passage of time. Uh, well, if there is an expenditure which is incurred due to mere passage of time, time value of money, that is a finance cost. And hence, you will record a finance cost 
at 14 lakh 20 into 5 percent again for a six month period so the journal entry for this would be a finance cost account debit to provision and this finance cost will be taken to the pnl account as you can see the provision for site restoration which was originally 14 20 increases by 35 lakh uh, 35500 and hence we can see the closing provision to be 14 lakh 55500 so basically in the balance sheet you will see a property plant and equipment after deducting depreciation uh, you will see within the non current liability a provision for site restoration after adding uh, uh, the necessary finance cost in the PNL under the heading of depreciation and amortization you would have depreciation charge and you'll have a finance cost for the unwinding of discount okay so that takes care of question number 10 next we go to question number 11 as you can see this question is based on agriculture uh, well uh, honestly it is on a student to identify whether this is on agriculture or it is on India 16 that is property plant and equipment uh, we have around 100 penis radiata trees, trees now uh, we have been explained the nature of these trees these trees uh, are, are have a life of 30 years and are eventually going to be used as material for con uh, for in the construction industry for let us say for furniture etc in which case uh, we need to first figure out whether these trees are bearer plants. So these are biological assets. Trees are biological assets. Now, as per India 16, that is property plant and equipment, biological assets which are in the nature of bearer plants get covered under India 16. And hence you need to follow the principles of India 16. And if you are not covered under the bearer plants, other than bearer plants, then you go under index 41, that is agriculture, in which case you need to follow, uh, you need to record the assets at fair value, less cost to sell, do not depreciate, uh, and you follow the index 41 principles. So as you can see in the question, these trees are going to be used themselves as materials for uh, the construction industry. Uh, if we remember the definition for bearer plants, how do we define bearer plants? Bearer plants are those plants among other things which ha which bear agricultural produce and are not agricultural produce themselves for example a mango tree bears mangoes that is an agricultural produce and the mango tree itself is not the agricultural produce on the other hand you look at something like a bamboo tree the bamboo the bamboo itself is the agricultural produce and hence bamboo is not a bearer plant uh, but a mango tree is a bearer plant in this case the pinus radiata trees are themselves going to be agricultural produce so they will mature after 30 years and after 30 years uh, these trees will themselves become agricultural produce and hence uh, these trees are not bearer plants because they are not bearer plants index 41 applies are we clear with this so the first part over here we are trying to figure out whether these trees uh, are bearer plants or not so as a result in the first two cases we come to the conclusion they are not bearer plants and hence index 41 applies now what are the principles of valuation under index 41 uh, a plant which is covered under the agriculture standard has to be measured at fair value less cost to sell at each balance sheet date uh, it does not get depreciated uh, will be measured at fair value less uh, cost to sell any difference will be taken through the profit and loss account so we need to find a fair value as you can see in the question the fair value seems to be quite clearly given both at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year at the beginning of the year the fair value per plant is given to be 171 at the end of the year fair value per plant is given to be uh, 165 well we are holding 100 trees but per tree we have been given fair values uh, it is important to note that these are fair values of a mature however the plantation that we are holding is still not a mature plantation at the beginning of the year uh, we are uh, that plantation is 10 years old and hence we still have 20 more years to mature at the end of the year one more year would have passed and hence we still have 19 years to mature at the end of the year and as a result we are not holding a mature plantation so it would be inappropriate to take the fair value of our plantation to be same as the fair value as the mature plantation so how do we determine the fair value the question tells us that in that entire 20 year period or 19 year period there would be immaterial cash flows so the trees would grow on their own you would not have to specifically incur any specific cash flows for these trees and as a result uh, there's no other base uh, for value you would just take the impact of time so the time that it will require for you to fetch 171 or 165 as the case maybe you can sell these plants at 171 or 165 but these are mature plants it will take you another 19 years from 31st March 18 or around 
20 years from 31st March 17 to sell these plants at the rate of either 171 or 165 as the case may be and hence we need to try to find the present value. The fair value of this plantation would be the present value of the cash flows discounted at the given rate of 6%. So over here we apply the discount factors. Uh, at the end of the year we still have 19 years to mature at the beginning of the year we have 20 years to mature and as a result we apply the corresponding discounting factors and try to find the notional fair value per tree uh, 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 at the end of 31st March 17 and 31st March 18 uh, as you can see that that there are 100 trees and hence we try to find the total fair value. So at the beginning of the year, the 100 trees should appear in your balance sheet under the heading of biological assets at 5335.2. At the end of the year, these same trees should appear at 5461.5. Now as per index 41, the differences in fair value should be adjusted against the profit and loss account directly as fair value change account. And as a result, the fair value gain of 126.30 would be recorded in the profit and loss account directly. Okay. We go to the next question that is uh, on uh, India's 23 that is borrowing cost. Uh, so this is again an interesting question on borrowing cost. Uh, uh, it covers uh, a, a project where expenditures are made from around uh, April to January and loans are taken. There is a specific loan of uh, around 2 lakhs which is taken and then there are general borrowings that the entity itself has. So in case of borrowing cost, again our presentation in this question is slightly different from the presentation in the institute. You can follow either of, the, uh, either of those. The answers continue to remain the same. So what do we say? We say that specific borrowings are those borrowings which are dedicatedly taken for the purpose of the qualifying asset only and hence the borrowing cost that is incurred on the specific borrowings has to be capitalized. So first of all we try to find the interest on the specific borrowings. While the specific borrowings are for a 2 lakh amount, the rate of interest is 9%. But remember, the period for construction of the asset is only 10 months. That is from 1st of April to let us say 31st of January. And hence, uh, we can capitalize the uh, uh, specific borrowings uh, only for a, the borrowing cost only for a 10 month period. After that, uh, the asset is ready for use and capitalization would stop. So around 15,000 would be capitalized for specific borrowings. Then we go to general borrowings. The company has two general borrowings. One is for 7 lakhs with the rate of interest of 12 percent another is 9 lakhs for the rate of interest of 11 uh, percent now we have not been given dates on which these borrowings have been taken so we assume that these borrowings are already there with the company uh, on 1st of april itself so as a result we try to calculate the weighted average borrowing rate the weighted average borrowing rate would take the interest well we have taken interest only for the period uh, during which uh, uh, during which the construction uh, was happening uh, the institute has taken it for the entire year. In this question, honestly, it does not matter because uh, the borrowings were there for the entire period. However, if the if one of the borrowings were t was taken during the intermediate period, that would have created a problem. So we are doing uh, the full proof method where we take uh, the borrowing cost which is incurred during the construction phase. And hence, as a borrowing cost is only for a 10 month period, we should also take the weighted average borrowing also during the 10 month period. So this will help us in calculating the weighted average borrowing rate that is 11.4375 percent okay so out of the total cost incurred for the project two lakhs is coming out of specific borrowings and the project starts on first of april the specific borrowings are also taken in april so we assume that the initial expenditure from the project is financed from the specific borrowings itself so over here in the first month that is in april we have incurred one lakh fifty uh, well we have assumed that this 1,50,000 is entirely taken from specific borrowings. We have already capitalized as you can see the cost for specific borrowings and we don't use that expenditure again. We don't do a double capitalization. Okay. In the next, uh, uh, in the next phase, two lakh of expenditure is incurred. I think in August, um, out of this two lakh, fifty thousand is again to be taken from specific borrowings. Because specific borrowings were two lakhs, out of which one lakh fifty was used for financing expenditure in April, and hence the balance fifty is used for financing expenditure in the month of uh, uh, August. Now. The other expenditure that is 2 lakh minus 50 is definitely not from the specific borrowing. So we assume that this expenditure might have been incurred from the general borrowings. And what is the rate? What is the cost for each expenditure in the general borrowings? As we have calculated, that's 11.4375%. So 1 lakh 50,000 uh, is incurred out of the general borrowings. Uh, this expenditure, we are trying to find something called as average annual expenditure. So 
11.4375 percent is per annum as you can see this is uh, the rate per annum so we try to find out the average annual expenditure per annum institute has done it in a much more simplified manner i would say they have calculated the uh, uh, expenditures at each and every month and you can easily do that as well so uh, what we have done over here is we've tried to find a single number the average annual expenditure uh, so we would say that 1 lakh 50 spent for six months is how much spent for the entire year so we multiply this by 6 by 12 in a similar manner uh, we try to do the similar calculation uh, for the next money spent that is on 3 lakh 50 uh, that is for the remaining four months and then last one lakh which is incurred in the month of january that gives us a weighted average annual expenditure of 2 lakh rupees uh, the weighted average annual expenditure of 2 lakh rupees so it is say it is said that we have tried to convert the stream of expenditures that are incurred on various different dates into one stream of expenditure incurred let us say at the beginning uh, and which is outstanding for the entire year this will help us in calculating the eligible borrowing cost directly so we take 2 lakhs that is the annual expenditure multiplied by 11.375 percent per annum which is also a, a per annum rate and hence we find 22 1875 uh, the actual borrowing cost is taken as 1 lakh 52500 we just make a comparison to see that we are not over capitalizing we are not capitalizing more than what we have spent so we have spent 1 lakh 52500 and we capitalized 22875 this is the capitalization of general borrowings so your total borrowing cost that is to be capitalized is 15000 this comes out of specific borrowings and 22875 which comes out of general borrowings and hence 37875 needs to be capitalized uh, the general entry for this is you would capitalize building so for the building you have in any case spent 8 lakh rupees uh, uh, that is not nothing but a summation of all the expenditures from april to january that you see in the table and apart from that apart from the expenditure that you have incurred uh, which might be in the cwip capital work in progress account uh, you have also incurred interest and 37,875 of that interest has to be capitalized and hence the cost of the building is 8,37,875 which will get depreciated. Okay, uh, so this takes care of question number uh, 12. Uh, next we go to question number 13. Okay, uh, next we go to question number 13. Uh, now, this is again a question on India 16. A lot of questions in this RTP are on India 16 PP. Please do study this properly. Uh, so, uh, in this question, uh, uh, the company is planning to construct a refinery uh, outside city limits and as a part of the construction, it is also required to build bridges, roads, uh, railway lines, which uh, help provide access to this factory. Now, the thing is, uh, should the cost of the refinery uh, be capitalized? Yes, of course, the cost of the refinery should be capitalized. It is an asset uh, which is going to give future economic benefits to the entity. The question is, what do we do with the cost that the company incurs for the roads and the bridges? and the cost that the company incurs for the railway siding now ideally they should be capitalized as roads they should be capitalized as railway sidings and appearing in the balance sheet now the catch in this question is that these roads and these railways are not exclusively available for use to the entity in fact the entity does not even have the ownership over these roads and railways uh, so can the entity show something as an asset in its books over which it does not have ownership uh, again it does not have exclusive rights to use these roads and railways and hence it is difficult for the entity to show these assets in its books of accounts because it does not have ownership over these assets however is the entity uh, can the entity expense this out in the pnl considering it as expense or should it capitalize it along with the cost of the asset and if capitalize ca capitalize it along with which asset First things first, uh, the roads and railways uh, that the entity is building are directly attributable expenses because these are expenses which are necessary to be incurred to bring the refinery in the ready to use condition in absence of the entity constructing uh, the roads or the bridges or the railway sidings the entity will not be able to use the refinery and hence these are expenditures which are exclusively required for the entity uh, which are exclusively required to be incurred by the entity to bring uh, 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 to bring the refinery in the 
ready to use condition and hence these are directly attributable expenses which need to be capitalized we will not expense this to the PNL account the second problem is where to be capitalized because we cannot capitalize it as a separate railway siding account or a separate roads account because we don't have the legal ownership to those assets and as a result these will be capitalized along with the cost of the refinery this expenditure increases the cost of the refinery because had there been no obligation on you to construct these railways and roads the cost of the refinery would have been lower so these are directly attributable expenses will be capitalized along with the cost of the refinery itself so uh, they will be capitalized along with the refinery that is the first part second is uh, you have to depreciate uh, the question is asking how will you depreciate it and what will be the presentation the presentation will be a single account under the head of PPE you will show refinery within which there will be the cost of refinery as well as the cost of uh, railway sidings bridges as well as uh, roads how will you depreciate it now in this 16 requires a component method of depreciation so if an asset is made up of various components which are major which are material and which have a life which is different from the life of the original asset then you should depreciate it uh, on a component basis each component should be depreciated over its corresponding useful life now we need to check for the life of the refinery versus the life of the railways and the bridges and the roads uh, if they have different lives then they should be depreciated separately however in this case uh, we need to ensure that the life of the roads or the railways of the bridges cannot exceed the life of uh, the refinery so otherwise what would happen is the refinery would be fully written off at the end of its useful life and you would still keep on depreciating the roads and railways which is which is not correct because the refinery is no longer there and as a result uh, 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 you would have to depreciate it on a component method considering the fact that uh, if the life the maximum life that you can take for the railway sidings or the roads which are by the way included within the refinery is uh, the life of the refinery itself uh, are we clear with this okay so that takes care of question number 13 okay we go to question number 14 this is uh, a question on uh, common control combinations business combinations in desk 103 again uh, another question on business combination so uh, if you read the question you have uh, pre-merger a situation where there is smart technologies who is having two subsidiaries cloud trees and uh, microfly both of these are subsidiaries which means they are under the control of the same entity that is smart tech uh, as a part of a restructuring microfly uh, decides to take over the business of cloud trees so eventually now cloud trees will merge with microfly now microfly was originally under the control of smart tech after the merger cloud trees uh, will now be along with microfly and both of them are still under the control of cloud, uh, smart technologies and as a result after the combination there is no change in uh, uh, the control the control continues to remain with smart tech only and as a result this transaction is going to be accounted as a common control combination uh, as per index 103 the appendix to index 103 if the transactions get classified as a common control combination then they will be accounted using the pooling of interest method they would be accounted using the pooling of interest method under pooling of interest method we take over all the assets all the liabilities at their carrying values additionally we also take over the reserves and try to maintain the identity of the reserves as it is so as a part of the combination you can see we can uh, see that the net assets with, that will be taken over over here including the reserves uh, will be at book value so your PPE trade receivables cash and cash equivalents other current assets borrowings and current liabilities are taken over uh, now our solution is different from the institute solution again so the institute has ignored the existing reserves uh, of cloud trees uh, they are negative reserves of 24.80 they have ignored it uh, well if you refer to page 15.61 of your study material uh, under uh, of chapter 15 business combinations it's quite clearly mentioned over there that as a part of common control combinations in the pooling of interest method you need to take over the reserves as well maintaining clearly the identity of the reserves and as a result as a part of the combination we do need to take over the reserves as well in this case the reserves do have a debit balance and hence we will consider the debit balance of the reserves and take over the reserves of 24.80 ICI has ignored this and hence our net assets come to 45 the assets liabilities including reserves that are taken over so this uh, these are again remember including reserves uh, taken over come to 45 uh, well the difference between 
the PC that is paid that is 18 which is given in the question and the net assets taken over that is 45 will be adjusted it's a negative difference and hence will be adjusted into capital reserve remember the differences in pooling of interest method do get adjusted against the reserves only uh, you cannot create a goodwill in this case uh, it's uh, a capital reserve adjustment capital reserve is 27 uh, remember another way to calculate as you can even see on page 15.61 of your study material another way to calculate the capital reserve is to compare the PC uh, with the share capital of the transferer so the PC is 18 and share capital of the transferer is 45 as you can see and hence you get negative 27 so as per the institute solution this comes to a capital reserve of 1.8 they've ignored uh, uh, they've ignored the uh, uh, the negative reserves of uh, cloud trees according to me that is incorrect you should take over all assets all liabilities including reserves and that is what pulling of interest method is uh, once you take them over the identity of the reserves is maintained and a separate capital reserve of 27 should be separately disclosed okay uh, Okay, uh, so uh, we'll continue. We'll go to the next uh, question. This is question number 15. This is on impairment. Uh, so this is uh, on AS28. Uh, the solution for this would be same under even index uh, 36 that is on impairment. Uh, so we just do it through uh, the institute's material. So over here, uh, uh, we have been given that we have three uh, cash generating units uh, who are capable of generating independent cash flows that is a b and c and apart from that there is a head office so the head office is split into two uh, functions you have head office uh, within the headquarters a head office which is worth 150 and an r d center which is worth 50 so the head office can be allocated on a reasonable basis to the cash generating units that is a b and c whereas the r d facility cannot be reasonably allocated in which case uh, as per as 28 the carrying value of a cash generating unit should include the carrying value of the allocable assets like machinery plant etc add the allocable value of goodwill well we don't have any goodwill in the question and the allocable value of corporate assets so corporate assets in this question include the allocable head office but they do not include the r d center because the r d center is not allocable it is given to us in the question that it is not allocable cannot be considered over here uh, so we will have to allocate 150 rupees on a reasonable basis to each of the cash generating units that is a b and c now we have been given that a b and c over here have a carrying amount of 100 150 and 200 so a student would say that we should allocate it in the ratio of carrying values but remember they do have different lives now a might have a carrying value of 100 but at the same time it does have a life of only 10 years which means the head office can support cgua only for a uh, for 10 years whereas the life of of the head office is actually 20 years and hence when we are allocating to uh, when we are allocating head office to a b and c we should not just consider their carrying values but also consider their useful lives because an asset which has a higher carrying value will probably take more share of the head office at the same time an asset which has a cgu which has a higher useful life will also utilize the head office for a longer period of time and as a result while we calculate the appropriate ratio we should consider both the carrying value as well as useful life and hence as you can see we take the weight based on useful life and carrying value after the weights so it is more of a weighted average carrying value uh, uh, we have considered uh, uh, the weighted average carrying value of 1 is to 3 is to 4 so 150 that we have should be allocated the 150 that we have should be allocated between a b and c in the ratio of their carrying values considering both the useful life as well as the carrying value as you can see the allocation results into uh, 18.75 56.25 and 75 being allocated uh, to each of these divisions so the carrying value of the cgu after allocation of the building because it is allocated is given to you okay remember we have still not allocated the r d facility for which we will need to do another test uh, we will have to consider the entity as a whole but for the time being we try to do the test at each cgu level this type of test is considered as a bottom-up test uh, uh, in which case uh, 
we try to calculate the impairment loss. So impairment loss is the comparison between carrying value and the recoverable value. The carrying value of A after considering the allocation of office building is 118.75 whereas we have been given that the recoverable value is 199. So there is no impairment that you can record in the CGUA. Similarly for B and C we can see that in B and C there is an impairment. So this impairment has to be recorded. Now we don't know uh, uh, the individual assets of B and C but we do know that within this 206 within this 206 a part of the 206 is represented by net assets of CGUA which is 150 and a part of it is represented as 56.25 which is the allocation of building the head office now we need to allocate this loss of 42 that you can see in the ratio of their carrying values. So this 42 will be allocated in the ratio of 150 is to 56.25. As you can see over here, the loss is allocated to the headquarter building. The 42 loss allocated in the ratio of 56 is to 206. They have ignored the 0.25 decimal point and the balance loss is given in the ratio to the assets of the cash generating unit. Uh, similar is the case uh, uh, for CGUC as well. Remember A does not have any impairment and hence not considered over here. Uh, the research and development center uh, over here is not considered still. So after considering the impairment losses, we can say that the smaller CGUs have been tested A, B and C and the head office buildings and we have allocated losses as you can see a does not bear any loss b bears a loss of 30 now how do we get 30 over here well 30 is taken from this point the loss which is allocated to the individual assets of the cgu c bears a loss of 3 which comes from here and the head office bears a loss of 13 that comes from 12 plus 1 that comes to 13 and hence as we can see a, B and C and the office buildings are at their uh, recoverable values or carrying values depending on the impairment testing which has already been done. Now what has not been figured out is whether the R&D center is impaired or not. Now R&D center cannot be allocated to A, B or C. However, the R&D center can be allocated to the entire entity as a whole. So the entity is M limited as a whole. R&D center can be allocated to that. So we need to do an impairment testing for something called as a larger CGU. The CGU to which even the unallocable corporate asset can be allocated and the CGU to which it can be allocated is entity M as a whole. Now M comprises of A, it comprises of B, it comprises of C, it also comprises of the office building and it also comprises of the R&D center. So if you want to do the impairment testing of M limited as a whole, you need to take all their carrying values, all their carrying values. So ideally we should take their carrying values after impairment at the smaller CGU because we have already considered impairment of A, B, C and the office buildings. So this would be the carrying values that you should take for the entire entity. However, M has not yet been tested and hence we can see that M, you will have the same carrying values. Uh, I am sorry, research and development center, R&D center, you will have the same carrying values. So, your total carrying value considering impairment is uh, 604 but we have tested impairment on all of these assets except for the R&D center. We compare it with the recoverable value of M limited as a whole. The recoverable value of M limited as a whole has to also consider the value that is attributable to the R&D center which is 720. Now as the carrying value is lower than the recoverable value there is no impairment. However, and there is no impairment. Uh, 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 however, if instead of 720 you had let us say 580 over here then there is an impairment loss of 24. This impairment loss of 24 would directly be allocated to the research center. Uh, well, can you allocate this loss to entities A, B and C? No, you cannot. Why? Because entities A, B and C are already at their recoverable values. A had a recoverable value of 199 it has 100 rupees of carrying value you cannot reduce the value of a similar is the case with b b had a higher carrying value but we have already considered the impairment of b similar is the case for c and the building which means the loss if any is directly attributable to the research center okay so it's an interesting question this okay we'll uh continue to the next uh, question this is on consolidation uh so this is again as per accounting standards uh, the institute has asked to you uh, consolidation procedures as per AS21 and AS23. Uh, so uh, we have been given a holding company Summati which has 
a wholly owned subsidiary Sheetal which it has been holding from 1st of April 2014. Now as you can see in the question Sheetal Limited was incorporated on 1st of April 2014 and hence the holding company has been has been holding the share since incorporation so all the profits that you will see for Sheetal will be post acquisition profits only because there was the subsidiary was incorporated on 1st of April 14 and we acquired 100% stake on 1st of April 14. At the same time, the non-controlling interest NCI has to be 0% because we own entire 100% stake. Now, what is interesting for you to study over here is how uh, uh, we have been asked on Dharam. Now, Dharam was a subsidiary. We had acquired an 80% stake in Dharam on 1st of April 2014, continued to hold an 80% stake in Dharam till 31st March of 17 and hence it was fully consolidated, 100% uh, it was consolidated uh, 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 using subsidiary AS21 principles. Okay, now what happened on 1st of April 2017 was out of uh, I think the 24 lakh shares that we held, we sold 12 lakh shares and hence out of the 80% stake that we held, half of the stake, 40% has been sold and that leaves us with another 40% stake only. So with effect from 1st of April 2017, that is during the year 1718, Dharam now gets uh, consolidated as an associate. The transition to this is very interesting. Uh, we should focus on the transition over here. Okay, so these are parallel subsidiaries uh, at least till 31st March 2017, after which Summati owns 100% stake still in Sheetal and uh, it owns a 40% stake and hence an associate in uh, Durham. Okay, so let's go to the accounting. Uh, we have not yet prepared the balance sheet over here actually uh, that's just a line by line consolidation. Okay, so we have prepared the workings over here for the balance sheet. We'll refer to the institute's uh, RTP material. So typically, uh, when we consolidate, we prepare the consolidated retained earnings, the consolidated reserves over here, in which we have first put in the standalone reserves that we have for Summati. Uh, at the same time, we try to prepare the working notes for uh, the entities, uh, which are subsidiary. So you have Sheetal over here. Sheetal, we generally prepare the cost of control account uh, and the non-controlling interest account as we have a 100% stake there would be no minority no non-controlling interest over here uh, we try to eliminate the items uh, uh, when we are trying to uh, do consolidation there are three elimination items first there is the investment which needs to be eliminated in the books of Summati standalone books will show investment in Sheetal in the consolidated accounts you cannot have investment in the books of Sheetal you will show share capital that share capital needs to be eliminated uh, because investments and share capital knock off against each other and there will be reserves. Now reserves have to be analyzed. Pre-acquisition reserves should be eliminated whereas post-acquisition reserves should be consolidated. So over here we eliminate the investment that is 500 investment uh, that you can see in the balance sheet of Summati as investments held. These investments are actually represented by share capital and hence we eliminate the equity share capital as well. As we had discussed at the beginning of the question, Sheetal is a 100% subsidiary which was incorporated on 1st of April 14 and the date of acquisition also being 1st of April 14 and hence all the reserves are post acquisition. So as we can see the reserves of 910, nothing is allocated to the pre acquisition period, the entire 100% allocated to the post acquisition period and we have added the share of Sheetal, uh, share in Sheetal uh, into the consolidated return earnings. A very very straightforward adjustment I would say nothing at all which is difficult in in Sheetal. Now you go to Dharam which is a slightly difficult adjustment. So in Dharam there was a sale which happened on 1st of April 2017. Now Till that date, you would be adding all the assets, all the liabilities of Dharam. And once you, once Dharam is no longer a subsidiary, you will no longer in your consolidated accounts add all the assets, all the liabilities. So what do we need to do? We need to remove all the assets, all the liabilities that are attributable to Dharam in the balance sheet. Remove minority interest if any, remove goodwill if any clean up the consolidated balance sheet for all the assets, all the liabilities, all the goodwill and minority interest which is attributable to Dharam till 1st of April 2017. We remove that in consideration we will get cash. Probably we will have a gain or loss on sale and at the same time we need to record investments because now Dharam is 
an associate and in your consolidated accounts associates have to be recorded at carrying value so as per a reading of as 21 and as 23 these associates have to be shown at a carrying value uh, based on the carrying value of the subsidiary now what do we need understand by the carrying value of the subsidiary this is the weight of the subsidiary in the consolidated balance sheet as on the date of sale so as on the date of sale we can see that dharam had a net assets of 700 it is given to us in the question that as on 31st March 17 Dharam has a net assets of uh, 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 700 this can also be calculated as 300 share capital and 400 of reserves that Dharam has as on uh, 31st of March 2017 so if Dharam is no longer a subsidiary the entire net assets 100% of net assets uh, 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 will be removed so the carrying value of Dharam in the consolidated balance sheet was 700 but that is not it apart from this you will also have a minority interest because we are owning 80% of Dharam at least till 31st March 17 20% is held by minority but we have consolidated the entire 100% of net assets so minority interest will be recorded as 700 into 20% that is 140 so what is attributable to Dharam is 700 worth of assets at the same time for 140 worth of minority is attributable to Dharam okay now at the point of acquisition of Dharam that is on 1st of April 2014 there might be a goodwill or capital reserve so we need to calculate the cost of control so as you can see uh, the question has told us that the total investment that we had made in Dharam was 600. Uh, 600 investment gave us access to 80% stake of capital. So well that gives us 300 into 80% 240. We have also been given that as on 1st of April 2014 the date of acquisition the reserves were 300 pre-acquisition reserves were 300 and hence 300 into 80% and that should give you another 240. So the goodwill of Dharam would have been 120 as on the date of acquisition that is 1st of April 2014. Now we have been given an interesting adjustment in this question that goodwill on consolidation has to be written off over a period of 5 years now in Sheetal there was no goodwill and hence there was no question of a write-off but in Dharam there was a goodwill of 120 rupees and hence over a period of three years till date that is 14 15 15 16 16 17 we would have written off goodwill this 120 would have been amortized remember this amortization happens in the consolidated accounts only this would have been amortized and the goodwill as on 1st of April 2014 would appear to be 48 this would be your goodwill on consolidation which would appear at 48 as on 31st March 17 so we are trying to find the value that will be removed from the carrying value that will be removed from the balance sheet the date Dharam is sold so the carrying value of the entire subsidiary is 608 the date Dharam is sold aggregate you will remove 608 worth of assets from your consolidated balance sheet now how do you allocate the 608 because a part 608 is attributable to 80 percent stake a part of it that is 40 percent which is sold a part of it which is 40 percent half half which is unsold so we say 304 proportionately is allocated allocated to the part sold and 304 is allocated to the part unsold as per as 21 and 23 this will be treated as a carrying value of associate from 1st of april 2017 Whereas, if we've been told that the sale happens at 360 rupees in your consolidated accounts, the sale happens at 360 rupees and the carrying value of the subsidiary is 304. As a result, 56 should ideally be recorded as a gain on sale in the consolidated accounts. Okay, now where do these all of these effects go? Now we are doing it in a slightly detailed manner as compared to the institute. Institute has given directly one adjustment. We'll try to understand how that is derived as well. But we're doing it in a slightly detailed manner. 304 will be shown as the opening carrying value of the investment that you make in associate. And hence when we try to find the carrying value of the investment in associate, the opening carrying value of 304 comes out of uh, working note 4, the calculation over here. Uh, this is the same 304 that we have referenced. Uh, the opening carrying value of the associate was still date, it was a subsidiary. Okay. Now, where does this 56 go? Well, it is again on sale, should be taken into the consolidated uh, reserves and surplus, profit and loss account. And hence, we add, as you can see, 56, the gain on sale of Dharam in the consolidated accounts, we add 56. Now, the problem in this adjustment is, 
we have been given in the question standalone balance sheets and as a result in the standalone balance sheet of summati you would be having investments of 600 rupees cost of investments in standalone balance sheet and half of those investments have been sold so in the standalone balance sheet you would have recognized again on sale in the standalone books you would have passed the entry bank account debit 360 to investment only 300 you had 600 rupees worth of investment this 650 percent is sold 50 percent is still unsold and hence to investment 300 and hence again on sale would already be recorded in the standalone books at 60 rupees we have been given standalone balance of summati as you can see this standalone balance will be after considering all adjustments including the sale of investments not subsidiaries necessarily but investments as per as 13 accounting standard 13 sale of investments would be recorded and hence a gain of 60 would have been already recorded now we are preparing consolidated accounts we have already recorded the consolidated the gain on sale at 56 rupees so you can't have double amounts you can't have a double counting and hence we will try to remove the gain on sale of dharam which has already been included included again of uh, 60 uh, as per consolidated the gain is 56 so we record the as we are preparing consolidated accounts we try to record the consolidated gain uh, however uh, gain has already been recorded in the standalone books we try to eliminate that are we clear with this yes okay uh, apart from that there is goodwill which has been amortized uh, as you can see in this adjustment over here 72 worth of goodwill is amortized the question is will this 70 would this 72 have been considered when we calculated the balance of 1 to 4 0 of summati now 1 to 4 0 of summati is basically the standalone balance this 1 to 4 0 is the standalone balance this standalone balance cannot write off goodwill on consolidation because goodwill on consolidation appears only in the consolidated books the account of goodwill appears only in the consolidated books and hence in the standalone books there is no goodwill if there is no goodwill you cannot write off goodwill so the write off would have happened in the consolidated accounts and hence we take the consolidate the goodwill amortized separately in the consolidated accounts uh, because 1 to 4 0 is standalone and apart from that uh, we have not considered we are taking standalone balances and then finding the consolidated balances so 72 at least has not been reduced Achha, if we were given opening balance opening consolidated balance of summati as on 1st of april 2017 yes that would have been considered uh, calculated after considering all the write-offs however not 1 to 4 0 and hence we are separately considering uh, a goodwill write-off okay apart from that dharam has been a subsidiary remember from 1st of april 2014 till 31st march 17 and hence if you look at the data which is given in the question uh, well dharam had uh, just a second okay uh, so we have directly calculated this so dharam had reserves worth 300 on 1st of april 2017 uh, sorry 1st of april 2014 on the date of sale uh, of 40 percent stake that is on 1st of april 2017 the reserves had increased to 400 which means during the three years 14 15 15 16 16 17 the reserves increased by 100 rupees that was a period during which dharam was a subsidiary dharam was a subsidiary and hence 80% of those profits would have been consolidated along with dharam and hence 80% of those profits would be taken that is 80 rupees 100 of profits earned between 14 15 and 16 17 80 percent of those profits allocated to dharam and hence 80 percent of 100 is recorded over here okay so this takes care of all the adjustments which are attributable to dharam and the proportionate stake sale and hence the net effect if you see of all of these adjustments 60 negative 60 plus 56 uh, uh, plus 80 and minus 72 if you see the net effect of all of these adjustments that is an effect of 4 uh, well we have just we have probably complicated this because it is the actual workings the institute has done it in a much more simpler manner just that it becomes a little difficult to understand on how that number comes in but you can always do it in the way the institute has done it we have just done uh, the longer method so that it's easier for you to understand as you can see over here the institute has directly added four rupees 
as 304 minus 300. Again, if we see the net effect of all these four items which we have highlighted is 4 rupees. Uh, that same adjustment is done by the institute in a much more simplified manner in a solution. So they have said that what is the cost of the investment in standalone books? The cost of the investment in standalone books is 600 for the entire stake. So on standalone, it is 600 for the entire stake, half of which is sold and hence the proportionate value is 300. What is the carrying value in the consolidated books? In the consolidated books, your total value is 608, out of which half is sold and hence this is 304. So everything that has happened in the middle for which 4 rupees extra has been taken in the consolidated account. So what we have done is as compared to standalone and consolidated there is an excess adjustment of 4 rupees all whether that is writing of goodwill whether that is post profits of 80 of dharam attributable to 3 years whether that is gain loss everything that you take and eventually the difference boils down to the values that are actually recorded in the standalone and the consolidated that is 304 and 300 and hence this is 4 rupees that can be directly calculated just that it becomes a little difficult for you to understand this in the exam you can definitely do this a lot more simpler method you can directly find the proportionate carrying value as we did over here 300 compare it with the standalone value take the difference and uh, uh, your adjustment is kind of done okay fair this is this is something where you need to pause and understand would take some time to understand this adjustment okay Fair. So that takes care of dharam. Now we are out of the transition from subsidiary to associate and dharam has now become an associate. In which case, all the profits that dharam earns after it becomes an associate uh, will be consolidated through a single line item. Remember, we do something called as a single line consolidation. We do a one line consolidation. Under one line consolidation, uh, whatever is the profits attributable to the post period, that is once it becomes an associate will be added. This is a printing mistake over here by the institute. If you see the solution, they have said that 640 minus they have taken over here 480. That is incorrect. Uh, you have been quite clearly given that the reserves as on the date of acquisition is uh, uh, not 480, they are 400. So uh, there would be certain differences between our solution and the institute solution. So you have 640, that is the reserves as on 31st March 18 compared with 400 these are the reserves as on 31st March 17 which means the excess 240 has been earned during the year 1718 when it was an associate 40 percent of that belongs to uh, Summati and hence 96 is added to the carrying value of the investments a corresponding effect is also given a corresponding effect is also given in the consolidated return earnings. Apart from that, the goodwill needs to be written off. Uh, okay, we also need to allocate the part of goodwill which is uh, 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 to be disclosed separately as carrying value of investments. So, the carrying value of investments was 304. And as on that date, the share in the net assets, Dharam had a net assets of 700 as on the date, 700 into 40%, which means uh, when we look at an associate, we are having an interest, uh, we don't control them, but we are having an interest in 40% of the net assets of Dharam as on the date when it we become an associate. So 700 into 40%, that takes care of, that takes you to 280, will be the share in the net assets you compare this with the carrying value uh, which is allocated to the associate so for something which is worth 280 as on the date when you become an associate you have actually allocated a carrying value of 304 on the very first day and hence that leaves you with a goodwill again as per as 23 as much as in india as 28 you cannot show the goodwill separately in the accounts instead you have to identify it you have to disclose it and hence we show a disclosure that it includes goodwill 304 uh, includes a goodwill of 24 uh, it is a disclosure again goodwill needs to be written off uh, well uh, i'm not very sure about this adjustment that has been done by the institute which is following it because there's no real clarity about it this goodwill the institute has continued to write off we have already written off goodwill worth uh, 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 goodwill uh, 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 over three years there are two years still remaining so this 24 is to be written off over the balance two years 
not as convincing this adjustment because ideally we're not showing goodwill it is very difficult to write off goodwill when it is not shown in the accounts however there's no real clarity so we follow the institute's uh, solution over here though 96 is definitely incorrect uh, because there is a printing error in the solution they have taken 640 minus 400 ideally 480 and ideally it should be 400 and hence we are writing off goodwill so if you are writing off investments again the corresponding second effect of this should be taken against the consolidated return earnings and hence finally we come we have given effect to all the adjustments and we come to the consolidated reserves of 2238 uh, uh, <coughs> there is a carrying value of investments worth 388 apart from this all assets all liabilities are to be added on a line by line basis uh, in your consolidation so for example when we look at the balance sheet you can see that the reserves and surplus over here instead of 2206 we get 2238 uh, that is because while taking the balances the institute has taken 640 minus 480 well there is no 480 number in the question uh, the reserves are actually 400 so this is actually into 400 and hence instead of 64 this would appear as 96 and this would be 2238 uh, the second effect for this will go over here where instead of 64 you would take 96 and hence instead of 356 you would get 388 you would get 388 so these two workings are the critical workings for you to remember consolidated reserves and surplus non-current investments in Dharam uh, well apart from that everything else that you see in the question is a line by line consolidation between Sheetal and Summati remember Dharam is now an associate so the assets and liabilities of Dharam is no longer going to be consolidated it is only the assets and liabilities of uh, uh, Sheetal and Summati which get consolidated 388 appears on the asset side over here uh, and there would be a slight difference apart from that all the other assets and liabilities um, are going to be consolidated on line by line basis okay so that is a very long question coming to an end uh, we will now proceed to the next uh, questions on index we go to question number 17 so question 17 is basically on joint arrangements this is an application of index uh, 111 uh, so what do we understand by a joint venture now under joint arrangements there are two types of arrangements there can be a joint operation predominantly or there can be a joint venture now what is a joint operation so for example if you buy a house in joint name so uh, uh, let us mr a and mr b together own 50 percent of the house each that is considered to be a joint operation how should that be accounted well the assets would proportionately be recorded it is joint ownership which means if it's a house worth 100 uh, uh, one crore 50 lakhs worth of house will be recorded directly by Mr. A under the heading of house property of property plant and equipment and 50% of the house will be recorded by Mr. B under the heading of house property uh, uh, property plant and equipment. However, if this same arrangement is through an intermediate company a separate legal entity so for example you want to buy a house of 1 crore so you invest 50% 50 lakhs in company AB limited another party mr b invests another 50 lakhs in ab limited a separate legal entity ab limited is formed and that legal entity buys a house in which case there is a joint venture ab limited which also owns the house property so a joint venture requires a separate legal entity to be there as an intermediary which owns the assets whereas in a joint operation the assets are generally owned directly jointly but directly in this case if you see there is alpha and there is gamma alpha and gamma have 50 percent of a direct interest in the property so the accounting as joint venture is incorrect the, the is as there is no separate legal entity as an intermediary you cannot account it as a joint venture instead it is a joint operation and hence the assets have to be proportionately recorded directly you cannot show it as an investment they have to be recorded directly so what is the total cost of the assets 40 crores is the cost now a loan was taken and hence there is a borrowing cost if assuming this is a capital uh, qualifying asset uh, uh, there is a borrowing cost which will be capitalized till the time the asset is ready for its intended use it takes six months from april to september for the asset to be ready for its intended use there's a 10 crore loan and hence 0.5 crores is capitalized which means the total cost of the asset is 40.5 and this 40.5 will be split as property which alpha records as half of it 20.25 uh, crores and gamma uh, 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 records the balance 20.25 crores okay uh, 
apart from that expenses are also incurred directly by the entities and expenses will also be proportionately recorded so the borrowing cost will be recorded uh, to the extent of 0.5 uh, this is this is remember the borrowing cost after the asset is ready for its intended use that is from october to march and the maintenance cost will be recorded at 0 0.04 crores that is 4 lakhs uh, maintenance cost cannot be capitalized so 0.54 crores uh, will be recorded by alpha and gamma directly that's an expenditure of 27 lakhs each okay apart from that uh, depreciation should also be proportionately recorded by each of these entities separately uh, in case the useful life is given okay so not a joint venture joint operation as it's directly recorded to show it as an investment in joint venture is incorrect okay so that takes care of question number 17 next we go to question number 18 now this is a uh, this is uh, a question on financial instruments. It is very unusual that the institute has just put in one question and that too, uh, not the usual types of questions of financial instruments like compound financial instruments. It's a question on impairment of financial uh, assets. So when are financial assets considered to be impaired? Uh, this is the expected credit loss model. The financial assets are considered to be impaired if the contractual cash flows that you are going to receive are lower than the expected or agreed contractual cash flows in this question the entity has given a loan of i think uh, two crores uh, there's a transaction cost of 10 lakhs uh, an entity has given the loan to the supplier for which the supplier has agreed to repay the loan at the end of two years at 2.4 crores so the contractual cash flows that are agreed under the loan are 2.4 crores based on this an effective interest rate of 6.9 percent is calculated and it is given to us in the question uh, so on the total financial asset value that is 2 crores plus the transaction cost that is 2 crore 10 lakhs you will apply an effective interest rate of 6.9 percent okay uh, this will give you the carrying value of the financial asset eventually this 2.10 crores will slowly slowly over a period of two years proceed to uh, uh, 2.4 crores however we have been given that on 20th of february now ideally that is in i mean ideally you should read this as 31st march 2018 do not read this as 20th of 20th of february otherwise your numbers would not match uh, let us say on 31st of march 2018 uh, there is a poor financial economic uh, financial environment and hence uh, we agree to ch uh, to receive only 2.2 crores at the end of uh, the second year that is 31st march 19 so the expected cash flows or the agreed cash flows were 2.4 crores and instead of that we are going to receive only 2.2 crores and hence there is an impairment in the financial asset so we will try to find the recoverable value of the financial asset which will be present value of future cash flows as for the institute solution again uh, the impairment happens at the end of the year 17 18 and hence one year is still remaining so you discount it only by one year uh, and you you will find that the value comes to 2057800 okay at initial recognition you would have recorded the value at uh, your original cost that is 2 crores plus 10 lakhs 2 crore 10 lakhs add the effective interest the effective interest is 6.9 percent and this is added in line with the institute solution for the entire 12 months that is why i said you should i mean ideally you should take it only for 11 months because this impair, impairment happened on 20th of february so this should ideally be taken ideally this should be taken for 11 months not 12 months and this discounting ideally should be for 13 months uh, However, the institute has done this considering all of these adjustments have happened on 31st March 2018 and hence the effective interest is added for 12 months and the discounting also happens uh, by one year only. So, the value in the books as on 31st March 18 as you can see, uh, 31st March 18 is 2 crore 24 lakhs uh, using the effective interest method whereas the present value of the cash flows that we are expected to recover is only 2 crore 5 lakhs 78,000 and hence there would be an impairment. This impairment will get recorded into the profit and loss account. Okay, so that takes care of question number 18. Next, we are uh, proceeding to the last two questions. Question number 19, not as uh, uh, tricky. It's a very straightforward question. Question 20, again, remaining a very interesting question. Okay, so when you look at question number 19, this is a question on share-based payment in desk 102. Uh, it's a question on cash settled plans. So we also call it as stock appreciation rights uh, or SARS. Okay, so in this question, there are 75 employees. And to each of these employees, we have given 400 options these options are going to be settled in cash and as they are going to be settled in cash this results in a financial liability and financial liability needs to be revalued at each year uh, 
It is not an ESOP. It is not settled in equity. If it is ESOP, we generally take the fair value of the grant date. And as equity cannot be revalued, we continue with that same fair value as on the grant date. In this question, we have a stock appreciation, right? And as you can see, we have taken the fair value at each of uh, the balance sheet dates and try to find the total employee benefit expense. We have been asked two scenarios that what will be your solution if the vesting period originally was four years? Uh, and then in the second case, if at the end, if during the second year, if uh, the vesting period gets modified to three years, then what would be your solution? Well, we spread it on a pro rata basis, on a straight line basis over the vesting period. And hence, in the first case, you will record the employee benefit expense till date, taking a pro rata spread over a period of four years. Uh, in the second case, in the first year, there was no modification. So, so as per the first year, you spread it over a four-year period. Now, at the end of the second year, you know that there has been a modification. And at the end of the second year, uh, well, you have a vesting period of three years only. So till date, you should have recorded two by three of the expenses. And hence, the ratio over here becomes two by three. And at the end, three by three. As you can see, there is no longer a fourth year because there is no vesting period over the fourth year. Okay, so uh, this will give you uh, the employee benefit expenses to be recorded. As you can see in the first year, the expenses uh, to be recorded are the same. Uh, as the vesting period changes, the expenses to be recorded in the second and the third year are different in case of a modification. So largely uh, in this question, two things to be checked. First is you remember you don't just take the fair value as on the grant date. You fair, take the fair value at the end of each balance sheet date because this is a cash settled plan, not an equity settled plan. And secondly, when you do the pro rata in case of a modification from the year in the, the year in which from the year in which the modification happens from that year, you would have to change the vesting period and spread it over the revised vesting period. Okay, uh, the journal entry for this will be employee benefit expense to in uh, the language of uh, the institute study material, a share based payment liability. In your solution, you've been given a provision for SAR or a liability for SAR. It does not matter the language that you use. It is uh, the same ledger account. Question now, question number 20. Okay, uh, we go to the last question. Uh, we go to question number 20. This is on provisions and contingencies. Largely, though there is uh, an impact of India's uh, 10 post balance sheet period, there is also an impact of uh, 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 discontinuing operations and uh, non current assets held for sale, India's 105 in this case. Okay, so as you can see, that in the consolidated accounts of U Limited, there's a subsidiary G, which the board of directors on 31st of uh, on 31st of January 2018 decided to discontinue now as on the date when you decide to discontinue there is no constructive obligation for a constructive obligation on restructuring to arise you should either you should have a detailed formal plan which uh, you have and that plan should create, create an expectation in the minds of the affected parties. Such an expectation is created once you announce the plan or start implementing the plan. So this announcement actually happens on 15th of February 2018. And as a result, there's a constructive obligation to restructure which arises on 15th of February 2018. And hence, a provision for restructuring should be created in the year 1718. Now, a student might think that your actual closure is agreed to be on 30th of April. So you should record the losses on 30th of April. As per accrual, the obligation to restructure arises, the constructive obligation to restructure arises as per India's 37 on the date when there is a constructive obligation, which is 15th of February. And as a result, we need to measure a constructive obligation uh, uh, that is a provision for restructuring. Okay. Uh, uh, we have also been given that uh, 31st March 18 is the balance sheet date and the date of approval by the board is 15th of uh, uh, May, which means uh, the period between 31st March 18 and 15th of May 18 is considered to be the post balance sheet period. Events occurring during this period which provide additional evidence of a condition already existing on 31st March 18 are called as adjusting events. Uh, we should consider them if they are providing additional ev evidence of a situation already existing on the balance sheet date. Okay. Uh, so how should we account for this transaction? First of all, we need to create a provision for restructuring. Now, as per index 37, what is included within the provision for restructuring? Directly attributable expenses to restructuring like legal fees, finder's fees, banker's fees, 
and termination benefits are directly attributable you are terminating because you are restructuring these are directly attributable to the restructuring obligation and hence you should create a provision for restructuring what is not included in the provision for restructuring well something which is not directly connected to the restructuring like relocation cost in desk 37 remember clearly identifies and tells you that the relocation cost cannot be part uh, of your restructuring provision apart from that uh, even costs which are in the nature of loss uh, future expected losses that are going to happen now whether you restructure or you don't these losses might have happened in any case and hence they should not be a part of your restructuring uh, uh, provision apart from that any marketing expenses or uh, systems and distribution expenses will not be a part of your restructuring provision in this question you have termination benefits which will be a part of provision for restructuring and relocation costs which will not be a part of provision for restructuring termination benefits are originally estimated to be 540 lakhs on 15th of february but the revised estimate on 15th of may that is at the end of the post balance sheet period is 520 lakhs now termination benefits existed as on the balance sheet date something happened on 15th of uh, 15th of may which gives you additional evidence of a termination benefit which is already existing on the balance sheet date it is not that the restructuring plan was announced after 31st march it was announced before 31st march and hence the obligations existed on the balance sheet date 520 is the more accurate number it gives you uh, additional evidence of a situation already there on the balance sheet date and hence we create a provision for restructuring as you can see we create a provision for restructuring for 520 lakhs provision for restructuring in the year 1718 for 520 lakhs first of all termination benefits are a part of provision for restructuring second uh, in this 10 uh, this this is an adjusting event and hence we take 520 now what will you do with uh, the relocation expenses where well, relocation expenses are going to be accounted as and when the actual relocation happens so if the relocation happens in the year 1819 you will record them as expenses during the year 1819 you are not going to record a provision uh, for uh, relocation expenses uh, in the current year at least not under the provision for restructuring okay uh, additionally uh, due to the restructuring uh, you also see that uh, uh, the question arises on whether there is a discontinued operation in which case the presentation in the PL changes a discontinued operation is presented as a single line item under index 105 you just show the net loss on a discontinued operation if you see your income statement however if it is not a discontinued operation you do a line by line consolidation which means all items of sales expenses revenues uh, assets liabilities everything is to be shown if it is not a discontinued operation okay remember the operation gets discontinued on 30th of april 2018 and hence it will be classified as a discontinued operation from 30th april 18 that is in the financial year 18 19 so during the year financial year 17 18 uh, we have a loss of 400 lakhs on g limited and this loss will be shown as a line by line disclosure the entire sales entire expenses and hence the entire loss of 400 will be shown in the year 17 18 on a line by line basis not on a single line basis on the other hand in the year 18 19 whenever uh, you record uh, we are not been asked but if you record for the year 18 19 you will show it as a profit or loss on discontinued operation as a single line item you will not show sales not show expenses a uh, 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 single line item we have been given that the expected losses are 60 lakhs during the year 1819 assuming these are the actual losses in the year 1819 you will record it as a single line item remember 60 lakhs will be recorded once those losses are actually happening that is these are expected operating losses the losses happen in the year 1819 well you record it in the year 1819 but as a single line item uh, as discontinued operations during the year 1718 there was no discontinued operation and hence full consolidation will happen all sales all expenses will be recorded okay so that takes care of two things in the question a provision for restructuring along with the relocation expenses second uh, whether it is a discontinued operation and how should the presentation happen during the year 1718 there's one more agreement which is something called as an onerous contract now what do we understand by an onerous contract this is a contract which is typically a burdensome contract which means the cost of fulfilling the contract or the cost of 
cancelling the contract uh, are greater than the benefits that you will get out of the contract. We have been given that there is an operating lease and this operating lease uh, becomes kind of useless because it is non-cancellable to 31st March 2022 and due to uh, uh, our decide decision to close the department, this lease, uh, if you try to continue the lease, the cost of fulfilling the lease is 430 lakhs and if you decide to cancel the lease, the cost of cancellation is 410 lakhs. We are getting this information of 410 on 15th of May. Again, the contract was onerous on 31st March. Uh, 410 gives us additional evidence of a situation already there on the balance sheet date and hence we try to select whichever is lower uh, that is what we would prefer to do and that is 410 lakhs we will create a provision for onerous contract as on 31st March 2018 we are paying this off on 15th of May so as on 31st March you will create a provision so what are the provisions we create 520 lakhs as provision for restructuring and 410 lakhs as um, uh, 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 a provision for an owner's contract and hence 930 lakhs would be the provision that you should record. Relocation expenses recorded based on accrual, uh, operating losses 400 lakhs recorded on a line by line basis in the year 1718, 60 lakhs will be recorded in the year 1819 as and when they happen though because it is a discontinued operation on a single line basis. Okay, so that takes care of our discussion on RTP for November 2018. Uh, I hope you have uh, understood the concepts uh, and uh, 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 I would, uh, I mean, I would really hope that this uh, video was, has been helpful uh, for you. In case you have any problems, doubts, etc., please do write to us. Uh, we have uh, the email ID as well as the WhatsApp number in the ticker below. Uh, if you like the video, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, thank you very much and wish you all the very best for your exams. Good luck. Thank you.